Yeah, live. Okay, we're on air right now. Okay. Hello, everyone. So you should hit got it here. What's this thing doing? No, that hangs up. Okay. Yeah, the touch screen. Yeah. Do we have a mic? No. Yeah, I've got the mic. Oh, you have the mic. It's, it's paired. So I'm going to yeah. introduce you. Is that a okay? Awesome. Great. using the Chromebook and then using this audio. Yeah. Yeah. 
We figured out how to do it without, you know, fifteen thousand dollars worth of kit. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hey. Well, <clears throat> so uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, just a couple of uh, sort of uh, heads up announcements. So this is, um, we had an event earlier in the year at the Museum of Flight uh, for the for DART. Just wondering who was there. OK, so <clears throat> we're planning to have uh, another event, but the polymer on November 15th. It's not up on the uh, it's not up on the website yet, but just to kind of like put that into your calendars, it's a Saturday, and it'll pretty much be uh, we're, we're thinking pretty much the same format as the as the as the dot as the, as the dot uh, events, which was like a, uh, a, a talk from uh, a couple of Google experts and uh, and then Code Labs to uh, get acclimated with uh, Polymer. Um, so, <clears throat> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, they're calling it the Polymer Polytechnic. <laughs> cool. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, what else? Some, just some announcements. Oh, uh, probably uh, last time you saw some uh, an announcement that came out uh, about us like adopting a uh, code of conduct. So we've done that because our group's become really quite large. Actually, we've just got a few of us here tonight, of course. But um, so we just want to really encourage uh, everybody to be excellent to each other. That's the end of the story, really. Uh, so <clears throat> if 
if you in comfortable time time, just talk to me or Mike or Jason or Brandon, and we'll try and make it comfortable. One last thing. If anybody manages to find me without signing up, I'm just going to put your name on the list. No. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, a short introduction is required tonight. So straight out of MIT, Mike uh, joined Microsoft as one of early employees. And at this stage of his career, he could be doing whatever he wants. And he is. He's coding at Google. So with no more of it to do, uh, Mike Koss. Uh, I don't know how you can hear me if I don't. Uh, I'm using the mic is better if I can. So, um, yeah, so I, I uh, did join Google this year, and I started in, uh, at the beginning of the year, and I'm in the Chrome team. Uh, but before that, I've been you know, an organizer of this group for uh, since 2008, and uh, I was doing a bunch of startup stuff. Um, so, and uh, my talk tonight, I'm not in the Polymer team, and I'm really just, uh, it was a technology that interested me, and I've been learning about it myself, so I, um, I don't pretend to be expert at Polymer, but I love sharing like what, what I've learned about it, and, uh, and I've, uh, I've also done some instruction internally here at Google, uh, teaching people to use Polymer, so I have a little bit of experience, but I haven't used it in a production uh, kind of application yet, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm pretty impressed and excited about, about the technology. So what I'm going to do tonight is um, I'm basically going to be giving uh, one of our developer relations people has produced this presentation. I'm just going to be going through that and then showing a couple of samples and some sample code in Polymer. And uh, would love to take any questions. So feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions at any time. Uh, if I'm not being clear, or you just want to, to dive in on something that I that I haven't covered yet. So um, get started. That's the author of this presentation, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Okay. So we're going to talk about what is polymer. And how do you use it and show some examples? Um, so I think it's instructive to think about the web technology and how uh, how it started historically. You know, uh, if you think about say, even the earliest web pages, they were they were they had this capability to be like little applications. You know, it was, it was a very simple form. But it's 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 not just about document publishing. HTML has has always had these kind of application like elements in it. Um, and those elements are the fundamental building blocks of web pages. Um, and they, they have a lot of interesting properties. Uh, you know, they're, they're little encapsulated bits of functionality if you kind of really think about like what an input tag is doing um, or a select tag. You know, it, it's not just you know, publishing some values and it actually implies some behavior um, about how how this tag operates in the context of a web page. Um, they're configurable. They have, uh, you know, they can take attributes. So this one has some disabled elements in here. So uh, it's not just about putting words on the page and formatting them, but you know, HTML gives you uh, these kind of declarative, programmatical, you know, elements in them. Um, and here's one that even changes the way the, the select, you know, by putting a size equals four as an attribute to this select tag, you know, the, the whole view of that, that element changes. Um, and then we can also nest tags and you can compose them in different ways. So here, like with an option group, you can, you can create uh, different ways that these tags interact with each other. Um, And finally, if you wrap it in a form, now you get something that actually has networking uh, support built into it. This will, this this has the power to you know do an HTTP request to a web server and to transmit your data to a web server. Um, and as a final kind of configuration capability, you can also write code against elements, and you can you can write JavaScript and access those attributes and and implement. And their methods on the different HTML elements. So, uh, so what has happened to the web? You know, since its introduction, I think you know we 
we've, since JavaScript is kind of the general purpose programming language that sits behind the web, um, really all the development has kind of gone as JavaScript libraries and, and JavaScript frameworks and it's pushing everything into the, like, the JavaScript realm um, and, and somewhat ignoring the HTML side of things. You know, obviously that, those have to be you know, dealt with to render things on the page. And, um, but if you think about some things like, uh, I was supposed to be a bill. Um, like if you wanted to build a, a tab selector across a web page, uh, there are a lot of different ways to skin that cat. Um, you could have something that that uses a lot of HTML markup, but using it in ways that aren't really directly what you're trying to do. There, you know, like here we're repurposing, you know, an unordered list element and uh, and list elements to be, you know, different portions of a menu and. Uh, uh, Obviously, kind of annotating them with tags and things like that, so we can bind them to JavaScript to, to actually make this thing work the way we want it to work. Um, and I'll show you. There's a lot of different flavors, you know, uh, including some frameworks that say like HTML. Forget that because we're just going to do everything, define everything in terms of just JavaScript and JSON markup, and and uh, you know. Almost uh, HTML is kind of an afterthought. That's the kind of the back-end rendering language, but as a developer, you don't even see it. Um, but what if the web um, really allowed, allowed you to create things that are more web-like, more HTML-like, and create your own elements that did exactly the behavior that you wanted? Um, and if we had kind of extensible um, Extensible HTML elements. So this is the kind of thing you might like to see if you wanted to, if you wanted to put a, a web page up that has three tabs. There's just a new, a new kind of a tag, um, uh, you know, give it a new name, and uh, and uh, so like an X tabs is a collection of tabs, and then an X dash tab would be an individual tab on the page. And wouldn't that be cool if that was all you needed to to kind of implement that functionality? So. There's a new um, web technology that's being implemented now across uh, all the major modern browsers. Uh, it's called Web Components. And it's, it is a web standard. And it's a, it is a way where you can now programmatically create your own tags and tag names. And, and they can get their own behavior. And they have very nice isolation between the way that they appear on the page versus what you know all the markup that you have in the page that are being used. Um, uh, and there's a bunch of other technologies that are that are kind of underlying what Polymer is too. Um, there's a, a templating uh, feature in HTML where you can you can do kind of substitution of expressions inside of uh, just kind of like server-side templates in the past, where you combine data and markup and combine them together. We now have client-side templates implemented as a, a web standard. Um, there's those custom custom element definitions or web components. Shadow DOM is an underlying technology that's basically saying I can have a, a, a fine interface between what's what's happening on the inside of my tag versus what's happening outside the tag. And I'll, I'll kind of explain that a little bit more uh, later in the talk. And also we have now a way of importing uh, HTML application elements or, or components as a unit. If you think about H, you know, what we have today, we have CSS, JavaScript, and HTML. And so if you're trying to use a library uh, that somebody else has written, you kind of have to figure out, like, well, let's say I'll pull their CSS in over here, and I'll pull their HTML in over here, and then I'll get their JavaScript code. And each of those things is kind of processed a different way. You might minify it you know, with special tools for the CSS. And, you have to be sure that the CSS is going to interfere with CSS that you've written or that another component is written. And it's a kind of a messy bag. It's not, it's not a well-defined, like, componentized layer. Um, so um, HTML imports is trying to address that, where it's saying, you know, if you just want to use a component, the, the person who develops that just defines an HTML file. And it, in turn, tells you all the CSS and JavaScript that it needs 
and that can come together as, as one kind of modular component. Okay, so that brings us to Polymer. Those are the kind of the web standards um, technologies. Um, so what is Polymer? So Polymer is, a, is an effort that Google has started, and it's been going, I believe, for a couple of years now. Um, I think it was, it was talked about at Google I.O. two years ago, and, and had a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of emphasis at Google I.O. this year. Um, so they're using these web technologies to say, OK, we have, we have all these great new capabilities. How do we produce uh, a library so that developers can easily use and create elements uh, using these technologies, because some of the underlying standards are kind of still a little bare metal. Um, so Polymer is really a whole bunch of layers, and some of these layers are actually designed to vanish to nothing eventually. So we'll start off with native support. So um, we, we rely, obviously, on what the browser supports. and um, so over time, that, that, that is going to be more and more. Um, and that, you know, that's obviously the most efficient uh, to have, have things supported directly in, in, the, uh, in the native platform that we're running on. Uh, but then there's also uh, a platform layer within Polymer. So Polymer has included within it uh, what's called a polyfill. And so what typically people mean by that, if you're not familiar with that term, it's basically there's some web standard that is evolving. And that's all great when we hear about, oh, that's a great new web standard. I wish I could use it, but oh, unfortunately, only 25% of my users have the browser that supports that web standard. So to get around that problem, uh, framework developers have been developing uh, polyfills where they implement as much of the standard as they can in JavaScript and, and give you a library so that that library can be used to implement the behavior that's needed in browsers that don't support those things natively. Now, oftentimes, that polyfill can't be 100% uh, as good as the native implementation. There might be some holes in it, uh, rough edges, performance problems, and things like that. But it oftentimes allows you to adopt a technology earlier than when you're, you can be sure that it's 100% you know, you know, across the board supported in all the browsers. So a lot of Polymer's effort has been to be writing these polyfills to get cross-browser uh, compatibility for the, the Polymer framework. So Polymer itself, uh, the team there calls it an opinionated way to work with web components. So uh, if you look at the underlying standards, there are like some very low-level kind of JavaScript APIs for defining elements and things like that. And they're kind of crufty and, and not very pretty. Um, and this is a, a way that the Polymer team uh, thinks that uh, you know, this is a, a much nicer way for developers to, to implement elements and, and to include them and so on. So we'll, we'll look at that a little bit. And then finally, um, now that we have all these frameworks, uh, we'd like to have you know, batteries included. Let's, let's have a bunch of elements that are really useful to developers and implement some very high quality elements ourselves. So there's kind of two levels of that um, that Google is working on. There's a group of elements called core elements that are uh, um, designed to be used kind of across the board um, without necessarily specifically going after a particular design style guide. And uh, I don't know how many people have heard of material design. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Um, so Google announced at Google I.O. that they are they're migrating all the web and Android and and uh, you know, mobile so mobile and desktop platforms to a new uh, user interface style guide called Material Design. Um, if you go look for that on the web, there's actually an incredible amount of very detailed documentation about the way things should look, the way they, they should behave, um, and um, and a lot it looks a multi-year effort that's been going on at Google to uh, develop material design. So the Polymer team uh, actually has been trying to build uh, reference elements that are that fill this material design standard and they actually implement the material design. So material design is not just a Google for Google project. It's I think mean, they really want all the developer community to be able to adopt uh, the material design style guides uh, in their applications. Okay, so there's 
kind of two things you can do with Polymer. One is just I'm just a user of, of these new web components, new web elements. Um, or maybe I, uh, I want to define my own. Um, so I can create elements and stuff. And Polymer has a way of doing both of these things, and we'll kind of walk through walk through how that works. So there's kind of three steps to using a Polymer element. First, you got to find someone's got to you got to find you know where is the element that I want to use so that's going to be in a library somewhere. And there are already some websites that are starting to publish uh, interesting Polymer elements on them. Uh, then you import them into your project. And I'll show there's a couple couple ways that that uh, you like to use pack, you like to use package managers to maybe pull in some of those elements, um, and then you just use them just like they were regular HTML tags uh, in your page. So, um, so for finding them, uh, if you go to the polymerproject.org, is uh, there's a there's a very extensive library of the ones provided by Google. Um, like I said, there are these core elements. Um, and uh, paper elements, which are the material design elements um, that Google has created. Um, and I'm forgetting off the top of my head, there's a name. There's, I think it's a Seattle startup that's doing that has a Polymer uh, database. It's like uh, you want get Bone yeah. Kitchen. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, so there's kind of a place where you can go publish publish your your uh, elements as well. So here on this slide is actually showing us um, kind of using Bower. So I don't know if people are familiar with Bower. Um, Bower is a client side or kind of a web front end package manager. Um, so it is uh, a way for you to kind of download, uh, publish and download packages that are that are named packages. Uh, there, there's an online repository. And um, so from the command line, you just say like Bower install and all the Polymer elements begin with this you know, Polymer slash uh, you know, core toolbar or whatever. And it'll, it'll just go to the Git repository and download uh, the latest version of that element uh, source code and give you all of the, all of the components that are downloaded uh, to your computer. Um, so when you're creating a project with Bower, you can define kind of a configuration file that says, here's the list of all the components I use. And then with one command, you say like Bower install, and it'll read that file and, and download all the components. Or you can say Bower update, and it'll download the latest versions of the components you're using. So it's it's a really nice way of of uh, keeping track of things rather than like downloading, you know, finding a component, downloading a zip file, and things like that. Yeah, it work on a Chromebook. Uh, actually, uh, Bower itself does not work on a Chromebook, but there's actually a project called the Google Cloud uh, Google uh, Google Development Editor, I think it's a it's a Chrome extension, and it's it's also been in pro it's been a work in progress I think for about a year or so, um, and we actually I actually ran a uh, hackathon uh, here at Google uh, for internal Googlers, and some people just use their Chromebooks and they use that cloud editor, and it has built into it the kind of the Bower protocol, so you can. You can install packages uh, through that editor as well. So that's actually a really interesting IDE. It's pretty young, um, but I think there's uh, there's a lot of uh, interest here at Google in, in extending that. Yeah. How does this compare to Angular? Yeah. So Angular and uh, Polymer are kind of uh, different levels, I think. So Polymer is, is maybe a little bit of a lower level uh, technology and framework where it's it's designing, you know. It's kind of talking more about like how you would package individual bits of component functionality and then how you would use them in your web page, as opposed to saying, here's how your app should be built as a whole. Um, and Angular, I think Angular and Polymer could be used together. Um, and I, I don't I haven't talked to the Angular team. I'm not sure how much they they are thinking of that maybe they could refactor some of what they provide as as polymer elements or package them up as polymer elements instead of the way that Angular apps are, are just not built today. Angular has said that they're going to use, use Polymer. So this could be said Angular. Hey, okay. So yeah. So it will be a technology that the Angular team is going to evolve and use more and more of you know, as this becomes more standardized. Yeah. So is Bower basically a 
Oh, Bower. It, Bower is like for is like a developer tool time uh, tool chain that you would use. It's not used at runtime. No. It's it's meant for like pulling down your your data. Uh, I mean, pulling down the elements um, into your development environment, and then that you can work with them. Any other questions? There is an import step. So like remember, I mentioned the HTML imports. So this is what they look like. Um, uh, it kind of looks like a CSS import, except you know, it's a, uh, uh, you're importing an HTML file. So the, the definition of the core toolbar element is completely encapsulated by the core toolbar HTML file and then the things that it imports. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this, the, there are. With some of the with the polyfills, then these things are now support, are supported in IE as well. And I'm I'm not really up to speed on like the support levels of every feature in the browsers. Um, but that earlier slide I showed kind of had various shades of of uh, transparency of like how well supported the different features were in, in the different browsers. And this slide deck is a little older. Yeah, Greg. Everybody actually cares about IE. You go to status.modern.ie uh -huh. for a list of things I support and a list of things that I have to consider and a list of things that I support. Oh, awesome. So status.modern.ie. OK, cool. So it's like, uh, I always go to can I use, uh, but, but this is probably more forward looking and, and looking at what IE is going to be implemented in the future. Yeah, that's awesome. So. Um, yeah, I mean the goal. These are these are on the standards track, so I think ultimately they'll be everywhere. And IE support, you know, I think IE is doing a great job of tracking standards nowadays. You know, it's not like the battle days. So, all right, and then we just use them. So, I, um, the only the only thing that you can tell it's a polymer element is as a hyphen in the name. Uh, all the web component names have to have a hyphen. I think originally they all had to have like x dash something or other, um, and they relaxed it to saying, no, if it just has a dash in it, that will be a user-defined element as opposed to a built-in native element of the browser. And then, so just that amount of markup, and those includes those imports, so you can get a, a toolbar that looks like that. Um, and here it's showing it on mobile. So uh, you know, since the Polymer apps are also designed to be for first class elements on mobile platforms and tablets, you can use them to design mobile uh, mobile websites. And um, you know, here it's showing a core scroll header panel, which is kind of like a, a kind of a page thing that they could have a header in it. it has a toolbar, and this, and if you notice when it's scrolled up there, that thing kind of automatically shrinks up and then scrolls up out of the way when you scroll up. So it has a lot of behaviors in there, and you, which you get for free just by, by building the page with the right structure of polymer elements. Yeah. So where, where are all of those behaviors being defined? So behind each polymer element, there is a collection of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And then ways of binding, like for event handlers and, and and things like that. So all written in HTML and JavaScript. It's all written in HTML and JavaScript. So if you want to make your own, then you're using six technology. Yeah, if you're if you're writing your own elements, you'll be doing that. And I'm going to show some samples of, of how to write your own elements. You'll see exactly how it's structured. Okay, so what like out of the box, uh, this is just kind of a collection of uh, the kind of elements that 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 are in the Polymer library right now. Uh, over on the right-hand side, there's some things that are kind of what you expect for components. There's some list elements, some slide-out drawers. Um, there's a there's a whole application scaffolding element, some uh, toolbars and menus. Um, but also a little bit non-intuitively, over on the left side, you'll see some things like data services. Uh, what does that mean? Like local storage, AJAX, you know, like. So the Polymer team is like, you know, you can actually encapsulate components that are not just graphical, you know, on the screen uh, components. You can actually encapsulate behavior, like binding, doing data binding between the local storage and the data in your app, um, or, or doing AJAX requests to, to a server. So you can actually do some websites where you have no JavaScript at all, but it'll, it'll actually do an AJAX request, fetch some data, and then bind it to 
elements in the template. Um, so that's that's pretty cool. So, and I think in some ways, you know, like when in our hackathon, people were sometimes using these elements, and and it is early days, and some some of them didn't have like full functionality, and so sometimes it is easier to just drop back down to JavaScript and do things the way that you've been used to doing them. Uh, but these things are here, and they're probably going to get you know more and more. Uh, more functionality and, and more polished over time too. So this is kind of a kitchen sink page showing I don't know if you can see like all the different I don't know if you can see that on the screen there, but you're seeing different effects. Uh, some of these are like paper elements and the, the way the way things are implemented, you can see this like ripple effect. Clicking in these elements. Here's an element that only accepts numbers and tells me if it's not a number. Back to backspaces. Back in the browser. What was that? Oh, yeah. Thank you. No. That goes back to. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's talk about creating elements now. So like now, if you want you want to do your own functionality and maybe publish your own element, um, Polymer has a style of declaring uh, kind of this declarative element uh, definition. So this is the kind of code you'd be writing um, if you want to create your own element. So um, there's really think of there's like the wrapper where you have Polymer hyphen element. So you notice that. Polymer hyphen element is itself a Polymer element. It's a it's a it's one written by the Polymer team whose purpose is to define other Polymer elements. So it's kind of uh, the snake eating its tail. Um, that's kind of cool. Um, and within that Polymer element, it that element expects kind of two major parts. There's going to be a template part, which has Kind of like what should the DOM look like when this element's inserted in the page, and then there's a script part, and that's going to be all the behavior of the element, you know, any JavaScript that you want to put in there to, to implement some behaviors. Now this one has, um, I should explain a little bit about the um, what's in the script element. It's just a call that says Polymer, um, and then it says Element Prototype. So uh, what you put in here is basically a um, a, a prototype object uh, in the JavaScript sense. So it's basically kind of like a class constructor in a way. Um, and whenever you you insert a new Polymer element, it will create kind of a copy of this prototype uh, element in JavaScript. Um, and so the kinds of things you put in here would be like static data. Or method function methods that are named and things like that. So um, let's see some specific examples. Here it's just totally empty, um, and you can see the the template includes not only HTML but also a style sheet. And what's interesting, I think, to look at this. Um, so you see the orange H2 tag where it says, you know, hello from my element. Um, that style definition, there are other H2s on this page because it's in a presentation that uses H2s as well, but those didn't turn orange as well. So that's because of the shadow DOM that that, that element is encapsulated, and that style sheet is only applying to, to, L, to tags that are within that element. So now you can, you can kind of freely not worry about name collisions and CSS, and you can define exactly the style sheet you need just to define your logo. The local element. Yeah. Yeah, you can override them, and I think there's a there's a couple different ways to do that. Um, you you can kind of reach outside if you know what you're doing. You can reach outside the the into the outer style sheets, and you can copy styles down into internal elements. Um, yeah, but kind of by default, uh, it's uh, it's Kind of got training wheels on, so like you're you're not gonna you know not gonna have a much crosstalk between the the, uh, the styles that are on the outer page and the inner element, but you can do it if you want to, and, and uh, there are other ways of 
kind of important styles that, you know, if you want them to, to intrude into your element. Um, and this is a sample, basically they're just showing off, there's this attribute called no script. So actually you don't even need the script part at all. You can define Polymer elements that are just pure template. Um, in this case, um, yeah, it just has a style sheet and an H2 tag and, and there's no script involved in, in this at all. Okay, so now you want to start implementing behaviors. Um, so uh, Polymer has, um, you know, well, it's mostly like following all the standard, um, you know, web uh, guidelines for naming of, of event handlers and things like that. They also um, have added some things that are kind of Polymer specific. So um, here, like on hyphen click, you might use to seeing like just an on click. Um, attribute that this is different because it has the hyphen in it, and what this and then you see like the mustache like handlebars or whatever around the um, the say hello uh, word there. That's basically that's how you use templates and how you bind things between a template and your your data model from your prototype. So in this case, we have um, a function called say hello in our in our prototype, and then. And we bind a click handler to the say hello, uh, to that say hello function. So when I click on that, it brings up alert. It says hello. So um, so there are there are actually a bunch of things that Polymer is built in, and also created new some kind of synthetic events as well. So there's a whole rich set of like touch events and um, things that differentiate between. Uh, you know, tapping on something or pressing on it and holding it. And, and uh, so they, they've kind of extended the, and synthesized some of the events um, that you would ordinarily see like raw native in the browser. So, um, that is fine. Okay. Yeah, question. So, <laughs> That function is scoped within that Polymer element. So, but it is available. Like, if I were to say, um, you know, get element by ID of the of the Polymer element, this method would actually be exposed as a function method, and I could call it from JavaScript outside this element. So, what is something that wasn't available? Can I? If you wanted a kind of a hidden method, or um, I think what you, I think their recommended way of doing that is to kind of create a closure inside of inside of this uh, element, and then within that closure, you could find other kind of private private member functions. Okay, so this is showing basically a very simple uh, templating language. So very similar to that event handler binding, we can also bind data. So here in our template, you see the double curly braces around just the, the text string owner. And so when it evaluates the template to put it into the DOM, it pulls the data out of the Polymer instance uh, object that, that corresponds with this element. and and so you, you get the string, you know, Rob built me with Polymer here, uh, where the, the string is coming out of the data part of the element, and then it's combining with the template. And uh, further, you can define, you can declare that your, your element, like you, kind of the parameters of a HTML element are attributes. And so you might want to parameterize the behavior of your of your element that you're defining, um, and this is a way of declaring specifically, I want an attribute called owner. In this example, the default value is raw, but in the instance down below, when I use it, I say owner equals Alex. So that binding happens uh, when the when the element is instantiated, and 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 when the template evaluates, it it uh, turns into Alex uh, instead of raw in that case. Uh, yeah, there is bi-directional uh, data binding in Polymer, so it's um, 
it's actually uh, it's actually pretty cool. Um, things can kind of go up and down between JavaScript and <coughs> and HTML, HTML elements um, going back and forth, and also between different different uh, different Polymer elements that are binding to the same data values. Um, Um, you know, a lot of times we're writing, you know, either jQuery expressions to get find elements or you know, get element by ID. And I think the Polymer team felt that like this is just like too verbose, and so it, it's a very quick little you know helper function here called the this dot dollar sign. So when you inside of a Polymer um, prototype method, whenever uh, whenever they call your methods, this is bound to the Polymer element itself, and this dot dollar will contain a dictionary of all the all the elements, all the uh, kind of child elements of your template that have an ID. And uh, so, if you you can just refer to that. So here I can say this dot dollar dot name input um, instead of get element by ID. But so that's kind of a nice helper function. Yeah. Are IDs scoped inside? Yeah, IDs are scoped. IDs are hidden. They're in that, in that, in behind that shadow DOM. So if you do a document get element by ID, you won't find it. There's a there's kind of a root node to the Polymer node itself, um, and you can you can scope a search by you know for a That's it for that presentation. Uh, so those, um, also,
And if you pull that up on your phone, you'll see that it looks it can it looks great on the phone as well. So Dart and no, only an and. Dart has a second uh, Dart. There is a Dart Polymer project. So uh, Polymer and Dart Polymer are uh, basically designed. They're they're going for they're moving forward together at this point, and they are you know they are uh, you know Dart is the first class way of, of implementing Polymer elements and and so on. There's still some I would say there's still some rough edges in in like using JavaScript-based Polymer and Dart-based Polymer elements, um, and that's that's kind of been true of Dart in general. I felt that, you know like uh, um, you know there's you know if you're combining JavaScript and Dart, there's uh, there's some like glue code that you need to add to bind from one to the other. Uh, but the, the Polymer Dart team is now um, you know you know really working side by side with uh, with Polymer team. Um, and uh, so um, it should be tracking along just as just as quickly. So I think that our team really likes the Polymer framework as as a way of defining user user interface elements and things like that as well. So uh, it, it fits really nicely in the Bevel language. Yeah. Do you mean sandboxing? Sandboxing. What do you mean? Um, from a security point of view, there is not sandbox polymer. Um, uh, there's, there's, yeah, there's no way to like run untrusted code, um, and uh, I mean that's not part of the kind of design criteria for for polymer. It's kind of like running trusted components. Yeah. You can, you can, uh, you can, you know, it's, uh, it's, yeah. If they're they giving you source code, presumably unminified, you know, you could go look at. Oh yeah, for the import, I believe that's true. I think that's true. I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure about the, the HTML import. Like, uh, you, you, do they? Uh, I, I don't think it's limited to just your domain. I think you can go across uh, origins and import things from another origin. I think. No. That'd be a huge security hole. Well, you can do that with JavaScript, so you might be able to do yeah. a problem. There. <laughs> no, that, no, I mean you can import script tags from from other domain, other but you origins. Can't see, you can't see inside them. You wouldn't see. In well, if you import HTML, you can see inside them. So. I don't know. It would require the same box. This is just a, just to kind of go through that that code lab, that first initial code lab. This is what you'll end up kind of writing here. So you'll have a, you know an HTML page which includes this one. Um, you do include. It might be. Yeah, so like this platform, platform.js kind of is the starting point. You need to have that included so that uh, all the platform components are ready to, to install you know, Polymer elements. And then here we're installing like uh, Roboto font um, and. Core header panel, a core toolbar, and paper tabs, components, and a post list component. And we just have normal CSS um, in here, but you notice some of the the selectors are just are targeting polymer elements. And um, yeah. So do you know if the yeah, I don't think there's any difference in that. If you're using dev tools, uh, source maps are still supported. You know, and I would say generally Polymer support is is uh, it's good in in the Chrome Dev tools, and I think there's still some headroom for because there's some new concepts about 
uh, new types of event binding and uh, you know peering at attributes. But when you're in DevTools, you can look inside the Shadow DOM. Like you can open up elements, you can see what's inside your Shadow DOM, um, and you can actually inspect uh, internal attributes of elements and things like that. So uh, um, yeah, I've, I've, in my limited experience, you know, it's been generally pretty good. But there's sometimes it feels like you're you're not. Uh, you know, it could be better. There's some things you're going to be doing this thing, I think, with those who will be coming along, I'm sure. Um, there's a few little magic things in Polymer as you start uses. There's one called unresolved. So unres the, one of the things that the Polymer team is trying to address is that when you, um, like when you first load a web page, you might not have all the resources to like execute all the Polymer behaviors. And, and Polymer code, and so you don't want the user to kind of see what they call a flash of unstyled content. And uh, so their workaround for that now is that they have a kind of a built-in style uh, where you can say, this part of my page, I, is, I don't want you to show it to the user at all until Polymer's loaded and all the elements within it are loaded and it's ready to display. So um, that they have this unresolved attribute for now. And I don't know if that's maybe going to go away in the future, but uh, that's that's how they're handling that problem right now. Um, and so here you see just a kind of a top level web page that's using Polymer elements to define that page. And just a little bit of script to handle um, you know, an event listener <coughs> in the way you would typically hook up an event listener to any, kind of any, any element. And um, although it's using this core select, um, Core select element there, or event to uh, to determine whether you've selected that. Um, so then, this is this is one of the Polymer elements that we have, this this code lab defines an element called a postcard, and so here you can see style. You know, you see colon host. That's kind of the top level, the top level of your element um, from within within the Polymer element definition. And then it's targeting all the different parts of the element here. Um, um, yeah, there's some things that I didn't really go into with Shadow DOM. Um, that uh, this it's actually kind of interesting how you can when you think about it, like when your user is like when someone's using a Polymer element, it's going to have it's going to have some content inside of the use of the Polymer element somewhere, like where where they instantiate it. But then in your definition, you have a template, and it's got its own kind of body of, of elements inside of that. So how do those two come together and meet? Um, and the way that works is um, inside of the Polymer template, you have a special tag called content. This is, again, part of the web component spec. And it's basically saying, give me all of, like, suck down from my parent page all the child elements of my element that match a query. So this selector query that's saying all the image elements. So that'll match all the image elements that are represented in the, in the outer page and actually pull them into this particular point of my template definition. Um, and then it's going to pull in all the H2 tags in the next, the next content element. And then down at the end, you see just content all by itself. You think, well, oh, that's going to put all the elements. All, all the elements are going to get shown in there, or none of the elements. I don't know, depending on how you think that might work. But actually, what it does, it's kind of a uh, a diminishing set. So you basically, every time you use the content tag in your template, it'll pull some elements out of the, the containing DOM, and then those guys are not selectable anymore. So future content tags will not get any of the ones that are from previous ones. So what they're doing here in this is just saying, give me all, all the elements that I never pulled from my parent and, and pull them down into my template. What about the parent elements you pulled? What about parents? Well, so you have an image that inside you know, H1. I have no idea what it's going to do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Not sure. Um, Yeah, this was this was another Polymer element that's kind of acts as a service uh, to to deliver data to the other other Polymer elements on the page. What? Stop scrolling. 
I'm going to look for the page you want to be on. Oh, you're fine. Thank you. Okay. I think I'm kind of done. Is there any other uh, questions? So, yeah. what if you wanted you know, some kind of more complicated structure than just all the images and all the H2s? So, you want to have just first some kind of, you know, uh, H2 and then, you know, a box below each H2 list of all the images or something yeah. like that. How do you do that kind of more complicated? Um, yeah, I mean, the template language, I didn't show, like, the the template language itself actually has um, uh, more features. Like there's a whole expression language built into Polymer. There's uh, repeat iterations and looping and things like that. Um, so I think you always have available as a um, you know escape mechanism. If you're not doing just a simple thing of just like pulling all of it down, you you can generate queries which will give you the, the elements that are in your in your host. And you can you can figure out how to model. You know, if I'm using that as a source of data, then I can then apply those that data to the templates um, as well. So, but the, I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a limit to like how much of the kind of the simple declarative uh, that style can work. Yeah, great. So let's say you're uh, import element A, can you then reference element A and element B? Oh, oh, well, if uh, you can use polymer elements within other polymer elements, for sure, yes. Um, and they can both like they can also share data by binding to the same kind of parent polymer element as well. Um, and there's actually kind of an interesting like style of development. Um, this sample, this first sample, um, used a style which says, oh, the top level web. Page is just a web page, um, and it uses some polymer elements. But uh, in the second tutorial, if you go do the Google I/O code lab, they say no. Like our top level HTML page is just, you know, my app, single tag. You know, it's it's there, and and they push everything down into like being a polymer element. So like their whole application is designed as a polymer element, and that gives you like the capability to do things like uh, use. Well, a lot of polymer features for data binding um, in your whole application that, that you wouldn't get if you if you just start slapping polymer elements at the top level. Well, what I'm, what I'm curious about is like how polymer handles it. Yeah, if the polymer element, um, like if you use it and it never has a definition, like so, there's. Kind of built into the way that web components are work. There's there's kind of an in, internal registry in the browser of all the, the web components uh, that have been officially registered as new new tag names. And if you end up using one that doesn't have a registration, it ends up falling back to like whatever like you know random tag name JavaScript in an ordinary web page would just show you know I'd uh, treat it like a div or something. It'd be, It'd be pretty close to like just looking like a div with no behavior, um, and uh, yeah. So you there there are some events in Polymer to make sure that like you you don't execute your code, and the templates don't execute until all the all the child elements are included. Um, there's also a um, there's a tool called Vulcanize that's also from the Polymer team. So once you're kind of this style, you know, is pulling in a lot of like individual HTML pages, individual script files, individual CSS files. It's a lot of file requests. And if you run the Vulcanize tool, um, this is assuming you use Bower and you declared like all the dependencies that you have. It'll walk through all your dependencies and get exactly one copy of every JavaScript file, CSS file that de declares like the entire definition of what your page needs to, to run. And it puts it into a one big unified uh, files so that you know when you, you can put that into production and then your users are really only downloading one thing that has everything. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to um, 
So I think the, the question is, uh, can you kind of like compile away the, all the polymer glue and, and just just get a little more bare to the bones web app? Yeah. I don't think that what you're proposing is is in general feasible um, because there's uh, uh, yeah I mean it, it doesn't really try to introspect you know on all the, the code and, and figure out how to kind of expand it out it's, it leaves the structure alone um, and you have a lot of dynamic behaviors in a web page where you're inserting elements dynamically and um, um, you know so I and you know I, I don't think they really want to be in the business of like Disambiguating all your CSS style names so they all exist in one giant flat name space. Um, so I, I don't think they really go that route. Um, I'm not sure that you would gain that much in performance from really doing that. Um, so, well, the compatibility is still like you need like the, you still need like the polyfill libraries that Polymer generates, and those are those are. Uh, I mean, if you if you really want to optimize a lot, you might say, well, I'm gonna, on my server side, you know, do some uh, browser identification and only download the libraries if the browser needs needs the polyfills. So they don't support that here either. So your, every client is going to get all the polyfills whether they get run or not. So is there, is there a way to do like whatever my browser supports? Well, the polymer, yeah, I'm sure you, it's all open source. You can look at what they're doing. I mean, they're, they're doing exactly that. You know, they are, the polyfills are they're, they're doing feature testing to uh, to determine whether whether they implement some of the polyfills or just using it in the client support. You can you can use jQuery. Um, there's I don't think there's anything inherently like conflicting with those using those libraries. Um, and you know they all uh, I'm pretty sure they'll just generally like you can use selectors in, in uh, jQuery. Yeah, you could use those things. Yeah, I think so. Um, there's I think there's nothing inherently. This is really just HTML. With some packaging, and you know, just special ways of doing packaging and, and uh, you know, hiding hiding the effects of, of components from the outer page. So it doesn't preclude use from other use all kinds of other libraries. Back. Ah, testing. That's a really good question, and I don't really know the answer to that. Um, Mm, I have not. I have not run into like specifically like test frameworks that are really designed for testing Polymer per se. Um, that's a great question, though. Uh, I don't have an answer. Yeah. Is there a way to debug those that have embedded? Yeah. All the. I mean, everything. You can set breakpoints on any embedded Polymer method. You know, it's all available in Dev Tools. You can see all the code. Uh, step through it. You know, just just as normal. There's nothing magic about that. Yeah. yeah. So, 
JavaScript. Well, if you use something like I'm sorry. If you use something like the this dot dollar to reference like specifically named IDs in your template, then those are those are instance specific. So those are, those are bound to the, the specific child nodes that you have in each element. You, there's no crosstalk between them. Um, so yeah, there's generally like not really namespace conflicts between uh, elements that are inside of one shadow DOM and the other. Uh, you know, you're you're either querying from a host element, you know, down inside just your your shadow DOM, or from the outer web page where everything kind of is hidden anyway underneath it. Well, jQuery. Oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, jQuery. Um, yeah, if you just like dollar and a selector, that's going to start at the top level document level. And uh, I, know, is there way, there must, I think there's a way in jQuery like that a parameter to scope it to another child element. But that's not exactly what we do. So using the scope of jQuery is going to work because IDs in each child documents all have to be unique. So Polymer has to make Well, IDs don't have to be unique. You can get a few multiple elements with the same ID and get them all back. Not according to the standard. All right? No. Yeah. Okay. Well, according <laughs> to the way it works. So, well, but it, it, it's not reliable. Um, because it's not legal, it's yeah. not. But, um, but these are like nested within the right. element. I'm, I'm sure that I'm yeah. sure they're mangling the IDs, and that's why you this dot dollar service. But just like dollar left okay. parent, this dot dollar dot service right parent. Now you have a jQuery element, right? I mean, you can pass a HTML element directly to jQuery, and it's oh, sure. a jQuery. Yeah, of course, yeah, and you just use the jQuery selector as a wrapper, and uh, right. Get it, you know, bind to the jQuery methods. Okay. And then you can, you know, query on attributes on that using standard jQuery. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so let's say you create a, a component for a function that selects an element. Who's that select element 20 times or more? Yeah. And so now you're, you're that, you're that tool yeah. selecting through your code. Yeah. Um, is there anything like the watch? Is this Tell you which uh, input elements, you know, select elements, select elements, expiring that code at that time. Uh, yeah, I don't, I, I'm not sure about that. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, so, if you, so the question was if you had a lot of similar elements and you had an event prior, how do you know which element it's firing on? Um, I mean, the, the value, if you had a breakpoint set, you know, you, you could inspect you know, the value of this, and you know that'll be bound to that the, the element that is that has a method being called. Um, so you could tell. Um, and I think yeah, I mean, DevTools allows uh, tradition, other conditional breakpoints. I, I have never used any DevTools myself, but uh, for watch events. Yeah. Yeah, they're all sharing the same code. Like they'll, you know, if you set a breakpoint on that method, it's going to be shared across all the elements that in the page. Um, so you, yeah, you have to inspect the value of this to tell if it's the element that you are concerned about. Okay, John. Um, so you told us a lot about the what this is. Yeah. But they're doing this because they think there are benefits. Yeah. Have you got any metrics on the benefits that this engenders? Uh, metrics on benefits. I, I mean, I'm not part of the Polymer team, and they, you know, I think the, um, I mean, from what I gather from what the team is talking about, they, um, you know, they, I think that you're see, perceiving a problem in the, the complexity of the, the web application uh, development community. Especially as as regards to like proliferation of libraries that are incompatible and they all work kind of differently and they're all packaged differently and so I think this is kind of addressing the problem of like hey if we can kind of have a unified way of packaging componentized functionality then you can you can get a broader group of independent uh, projects that that can be used together and they work the same way and there's it's based on a web standard and. Uh, um, I think that's the primary. Actually, what's happening? I think it's too early to be 
what's happening right now that's been, I think within Google there's teams that are starting to use Polymer now, um, and uh, that it's pretty early, like to the front of it. Uh, you know, it's, it's not universal throughout the, you know, in, in Google anyway, but, uh, um, and, you know, I think just at Google I.O., Polymer, they, they released a lot of information about Polymer, but they're, they're, you've noticed they're not yet calling it Polymer 1.0 yet. So um, they know that there are rough edges. Um, you are, this is a bleeding edge technology, I would say, at this point. You know, it's very early, so I don't think we have enough data yet to, to say. Yeah. If you add an arbitrary JavaScript library, does it define me? Is it a great leap to polymerize it? Uh, Make it oh, if you had a, a JavaScript library you want to polymerize and make it so a polymer sweet. package, I think that the, the mental model you have to think about is like how would someone? I, I think in a lot of ways, um, a JavaScript style is kind of an imperative programming style fundamentally, and you're building classes and methods and things like that for your users to use and an API. And in Polymer, you're thinking about a lot more of a declarative model. How would someone like take an instance and just put it in my page? And maybe with no programming at all, customize it and add attributes and things like that. So I think the step I would take if I were like taking an existing library and turning it into Polymer element, I think about what are the things that make sense as could, I, could someone use my library purely declaratively without writing a lot of code? And I might want to add some of the features in that way, and then others would just be methods that, that I would add as extra methods that developers can call on that elements. Okay. I think we're done. Thank you very much.